Good afternoon, everybody. We're just going to give everyone a few minutes to get in and we will get started here shortly. All right, it looks like everyone is getting settled. We're just gonna give this just a few more seconds and then we'll get started here. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of League Apps, I'm excited to welcome you to our two-part uh, Next Up Forum on what you need to know about the youth sports landscape. Uh, first session is today. We're going to have another session a week from now, so we'll, we'll get to some of those details here in just a second. But whether you're running a successful adult recreation program and looking to grow your organization with new programs or you're seeking new sources of revenue during some difficult times, uh, this event series is going to cover everything you need to know about expanding into the, the wonderful world of youth sports. Uh, so we've got some expert panelists with us today that are going to share some of their own personal history and challenges and, and some of their perspectives on the opportunities in youth sports uh, and the impact that talented professionals like yourselves can have on the lives of young people and their families. So uh, some quick introductions. My name is Nate Baldwin. I'm a customer success manager here at League Apps. Um, I personally have, am a 10-year alumni of the adult recreation uh, sport and social uh, business. Um, and more recently, I had the opportunity to uh, lead the redevelopment of a, a youth sports program in Appleton, Wisconsin that went on to uh, national recognition. So I've um, had opportunities to kind of be present in both of those uh, sectors, and I'm excited to be moderating this discussion with some great guests. Um, also joining me, I'll do a more proper introduction here shortly, but joining me is uh, Nyla Batista, who is the president of the Volo City Foundation. Uh, we also have Benita Fitzgerald Mosley, who is the head of community and impact here at League Apps and is also the president of Fun Play. And then we have Tracy Gibner, who is the executive director and owner of the Tampa Bay Club Sport. And uh, just some quick housekeeping items. Um, one of which is, as I mentioned, this is a two-part series. So next week's uh, focus is going to be uh, transitioning from adult recreation programs into youth programs. So this is going to have some very practical application things. Today's is going to focus more on the landscape itself, so you can understand some perspective of what you're getting yourself into. Uh, but next week, we're going to talk more about transition, making that actual transition, best practices, advice, uh, lessons learned about making that transition from adult recreation into youth sport programs. Uh, so they, uh, in the chat, we'll be sharing the link to register for that, uh, that next session and hope you can join us for that. As for this session, you know, please feel free to use the chat function and the question and answer uh, section to ask questions of any of the panelists. And we, will, we are going to save some time at the end of this session to get to some of those questions. Um, and then lastly, be sure to join us in the next up uh, Slack channel to continue this discussion and engage in uh, some two-way conversation about this topic. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to uh, a, a more formal introduction of my guests here. So first, I want to uh, introduce Nyla Bautista, who, as I mentioned, is the uh, president of the Volo City Foundation. I'm proud to say that uh, Volo City Foundation is a partner of League Apps. And Nyla has a unique and impressive sports organizer background. Uh, while she grew up in New York City playing a variety of sports, uh, her professional career actually began in finance. Uh, and she later pivoted to sports when she moved to Baltimore to become the executive director of the Volo Kids Foundation, which was formerly known as Be More Kids. Uh, we've been working with Nyla and her team as part of our Fund Play Equity and Accessibility Initiative. And Nyla, we always appreciate your contribution to our community and to our events. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, next, I wanna introduce Benita Fitzgerald Mosley. She is the head of community impact here at League Apps and is the president of our Fund Play Initiative. Um, I'm, I, as, the, as the president of Fund Play, Benita is the first president of that charitable arm of League Apps called Fund Play and runs all of our community and pro league initiatives as well. So in addition to her day job, Benita serves as an advisor for companies and organizations, including 17 Sport, 
uh, the International Olympic Committee Sport and Active Society Commission, and the Play Sports Coalition Steering Committee. Uh, prior to joining League Apps, Benita served as the CEO of the Laureus Sport for Good Foundation USA, and also previously worked as the COO for the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee and Chief of Sport Performance for USA Track and Field. That's quite a list. Uh, mm -hmm. so in addition to her work and her volunteer life, we should mention that Benita is an Olympic gold medalist. She's our in-house gold medalist uh, in track and field and uh, is a youth sports parent of two. So thanks Benita for being a part of this as well. Uh, lastly, I wanna introduce Tracy Gibner. Uh, she is the executive director and owner of, the Tamp of Tampa Bay Club Sport. Um, I'm thrilled to have Tracy on the panel, uh, all the way from warm, sunny Tampa, Florida. Uh, Tracy started as a player in Tampa Bay Club Sport in 1997 on a free agent team where she was placed with her now husband, Chris. Uh, they were quickly placed on the advisory board and were very active in promoting Tampa Bay Club Sport. In 2002, they were given the opportunity to purchase the business. Uh, in her words, they never looked back. So after some years, they started uh, a family and placed their three-year-old in a youth league. And again, not surprisingly, they were very active in that organization and were given an opportunity to purchase it in 2008. So since then, they have been growing both companies ever since. So I'm really uh, looking forward to getting Tracy's perspective uh, on being present in both of these sectors. So thanks for being here, Tracy. Thank you. Okay, so let's get into this. Um, this is a big topic, um, but I'm really excited about it because it's an important topic. I think we a lot of times like to separate youth sport and adult sport, but they tie so closely together. Active kids become active adults. Kids who play become adults who play. So much like there are tangible physical and emotional benefits to participation in adult sports, the benefits of participation in youth sports are very well documented. Kids who participate regularly in sports experience better physical outcomes than their peers who do not with lower levels of obesity and higher level of physical activity as adults, we just mentioned. Better social, social and emotional outcomes, lower incidences of depression, anxiety, and other mood disorders, and also better educational outcomes with higher grades, better concentration, lower rates of negative classroom behaviors. So all of those benefits have been well documented through the years. Um, but with that said, youth sports in the 21st century is definitely a story of haves and have nots with fewer opportunities for local and community-based play, less opportunity for recreational play, and it's a situation where household income has become the number one predictor of whether a child participates in organized sports or not. So, you know, as sport organizers in our local communities, this can present both, you know, a real challenge, but also a real opportunity. So um, some of the first questions I have are, you know, you know we, in, in the scope of all this too is a pandemic, which has limited our access to um, participating at all in anything. But I guess the question I'll ask first is, what trends are you aware of in participation pre-pandemic? And are, are there certain age groups that tend to drop out of youth sports faster than others? So I guess, Niall, I'll start with you on that one. Any thoughts to add on that question? Sure. So even before the pandemic, and again, Aspen Institute and Project Play document this fairly well, the youth sports ecosystem lost almost 3 million kids um, during the transition from elementary to middle school, and that's before the pandemic. Um, and as you mentioned, um, the disparity between kids who come from in, uh, households with income under $25,000 um, consistently only about 28% of them play, whereas 47% of uh, kids in homes with incomes over $100,000 play. So to me, that's a really key demographic. And that's part of the reason why we chose to work with kids in the, in the six to 12 year old age range and focus on really growing that love of play and being active to, to counteract um, that drop off that happens really in the 13 and up um, age range. And of course, COVID's already only widening that gap. I love that you brought up that study and I believe we just shared that in our chat to reference that state of play study. But um, I, I think you had a great segue at the end there too, that that was the situation before COVID and COVID has only exacerbated that. I think there's another Another data point that sticks out from that uh, Project Play study that shows that um, since COVID has hit, 
uh, participation in sport has actually declined by six and a half hours per week for the average child uh, during the pandemic. And there, within that number, there's significant socioeconomic disparities as well. Um, you mentioned some of the household income stats. One of them that really stood out to me was that uh, during the pandemic is that children from sub $50,000 households report participating two and a half hours less per week than children from $100,000 plus households. So that's, that's a pretty dramatic disparity. So, um, you know, that, that presents a real challenge. So I, I guess, Tracy, I'll ask this next question of you is, can you speak to what it's been like for your programs during that pandemic? What has the impact been uh, of COVID on, on your programs? Sure. Um, well, obviously in the spring of 2020, all of our leagues stopped. Um, everything was canceled, put on hold, delayed, whatever term you want to use. Uh, but then we started up again uh, in the fall <laughs> of um, 2020. And our participation was at like 50% of normal, um, which I was surprised. Um, but it was really hard to get the feedback and everyone was kind of waffling. Are they comfortable? Are they not parents wise um, about coming out and playing? The good thing was everything was outdoors, um, but still there was that worry. So we did allow some parents to try it. And if they didn't like it, we could cancel and give them a credit. Um, but yeah, we were at 50%. And even now uh, we're still not back, uh, but the spring 21 numbers are definitely better than fall, but not what they were before. Um, so we're hopefully getting back. <laughs> That's the goal. We've talked about this in some previous um, town halls too. Just that it's it's kind of, it's such an individual situation for so many families. What they feel comfortable with and how important that organizational transparency can be, just to create that that comfort level to come back when they're ready. But ultimately, there's a limit to what you can do. You know, in terms of um, getting people to reintroduce something into their life that they might not be comfortable to do just yet. And un until they feel, until such time as they do feel safe. But um, Nyla, is there anything that you can add from a, a sure. in terms of participation and how that impacted your program specifically in this past year? Of course. So similar to Tracy, um, in March of last year, we stopped programming across the board. Um, and as, as long as it was, as soon as it was no longer safe to gather in person, that kind of was our deciding factor. Um, but then very quickly, it became clear that we couldn't just stop our operations when schools and fields shut down. Um, as an organization, we had a decision to make. Could we find a way to safely serve our families or did we really have to stop? And what we found um, due to, from talking to our parents, talking to our coaches and our volunteers, um, shutting down the schools due to the pandemic severed students not only from their classrooms and learning, but also from their friends, from their extracurricular activities, from the com com uh, community that they really um, use for support. And that happened especially in disadvantaged communities um, where parents are also stressed, struggling with poverty, unemployment, while also managing these new school responsibilities. So for us, it became pretty clear pretty quickly that our families needed the community and access to activity that we provided. So we had to completely reimagine how we could safely serve our communities. Um, we pivoted into virtual programming. Um, we've done activity videos starring our kids' favorite coaches. We've done pop-up virtual events that are activity-based, but not necessarily sports-specific. And then we've also um, provided um, virtual sports series where kids can participate from home um, via Zoom with a coach that they recognize, and then supplemented that by partnering with um, Leveling the Playing Field to um, hold these uh, equipment giveaway events in order to support that virtual programs. So I think for us, um, we struggled for sure. We returned um, in a very, at a very, very small scale, really only in Baltimore. But the silver lining is that now we have this new product that addresses the barriers to, trans, um, to participation, such as transportation, which was a barrier before COVID um, that all, all really organizations in the youth space are, are struggling with, you know, how do parents get their kids to and from the field if, it, if the program isn't close enough. Um, so, so we really had to innovate. We really had to pivot. Um, the other challenge that I think um, 
what we, I guess, seems natural, but how do we fund all of this? Previously, our funding was really centered around um, events and we had to pivot on that front too. We started fundraising through virtual events like trivia. We did a virtual 5K. We went into grant opportunities. It's just, it was a complete um, reimagining of how our organization can continue to serve our communities. I think what you're highlighting is really important too in that the degree of nuance that exists in the youth sports space versus maybe the adult sports space you know, there's a lot more, there's a, there's a lot more elements here to consider when, when determining whether or not a child can participate or has the ability to participate, things like transportation, right. things like the relationship with the school, things like geographic access, um, all become critically important to whether or not a child participates or not. And those are things we'll dive into a little more in depth uh, next week. Um, but I think it's a great point to raise here. Um, Benita, I want to ask you this one. Um, we know that some kids have more access to sports than others, like we were just talking about, but you know, you have some experience working through Laureus. What, what have you seen in your work through Laureus in this regard? <clears throat> Is there anything you can share with us on that in terms of diversity access? Um, and can you speak to the work that maybe you did through the USOPC that speaks to this as well? Can you tie that together for us? Uh, certainly, I, I wish I could tie it together. There's not a whole lot of uh, work specifically done in underserved communities and increasing access to sport at the USOPC. I think uh, for, for that particular uh, organization, the focus has been on the athlete development pipeline and uh, really addressing the, uh, the idea that kids specialize too soon, that they are uh, the, the advantages of being a multi-sport athlete uh, for so many athletes that think, oh gosh, I got to specialize in order to be really good at my sport. What the studies show that the USOPC has done is that uh, actually the reverse is true, that those athletes that are multi-sport athletes, not only through high school, middle school and high school, but many through college are end up being our best Olympic athletes and most successful Olympic athletes. And so it's something about um, uh, not specializing too soon, about not getting burned out on your sport, about developing, you know, different muscle groups and strengths uh, that you get from, from kind of cross training in different sports that has actually helped athletes be better overall athletes. But when they finally decide to specialize in that particular sport, yeah, they have better outcomes and more success. On the Loria side, you know, for four years, I, I led an organization that used uses sport as a tool for social change and, the, and really advocating and supporting and funding sports-based youth development organizations. Uh, those organizations, as many of you know, are, are just put in place to use sport as the hook to get kids involved. And then it's a positive youth development experience that comes out of that, that, uh, that delivers outcomes related to, you know, improve, the, the ones that you rattled off at the very beginning, uh, Nate. And, and certainly I think all of us that participated in sports as youngsters definitely learn team building and learn certain social skills and so learn, uh, uh, you know, goal setting and, and many of those uh, skills, but there are programs that are uh, intentionally designed to develop those skills in a very meaningful, direct way. And when that happens, when you couple the physical activity, the <clears throat> camaraderie, the social skills that kids get from just purely playing sports with a very intentional curriculum that develops specific uh, social, emotional uh, education, then you get the outcomes that you're that you're trying to drive and help particularly kids who are uh, experiencing trauma in other areas of their life, be it poverty or hunger or um, abuse or violence uh, in underserved communities or inner city communities, oftentimes those kids can develop skills that they otherwise wouldn't in other parts of their lives and allows them to have a better chance at success, lifelong success. And so there was a recent study by by Laureus around uh, that I actually helped fund uh, through a, a grant from the Allstate Foundation while I was still CEO uh, later, about a year and a half ago, I left uh, last spring, that really shows that those kids in these uh, SBYD programs that have this positive youth development uh, have much higher level uh, social emotional learning uh, and skill development than, than kids who don't. And 
we knew that, uh, you know, just through kind of uh, our own anecdotal uh, studies, but, but to have that in black and white and have a longitudinal study that, that shows that is really important, I think, for the sector. I'm so thankful for some of that past work in this space and the work you continue to do here because I think it's so, as a parent, it's so easy to get wrapped up in the results part of this yeah. or performance part of this. And back to the original lead in to this topic, you, we, we forget about all of the, um, all, of, all of the social, emotional, uh, educational benefits that kids obtain through their participation in sports as well. Yet those are the factors that lead to children becoming healthy, well-rounded, active adults. And if you would ask any parent what their number one priority is for their children, I would think it would be that they yeah. produce, you know, well-rounded, healthy, uh, eventual adults. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad you made that connection and I, I appreciate that insight. And that's a great lead into our next topic, which is the topic of competitive pressure and specialization, which was something you also talked about in that last uh, segment here. But Another trend we've seen in the youth sports world, especially over the past 10 to 15 years, I would say maybe even longer than that, has been this drift towards specialized, highly competitive, travel-based play, even at very young ages, seven, eight, nine years old, often believing that this is the formula that leads to better athletic outcomes for our kids. That's the sales pitch anyway. Um, however, the data tells us a very different story about this. When organizations focus on results over the joy of a sports experience, we actually see significantly higher rates of dropout, higher rates of injury. And if we ask kids themselves, they would tell you that the things that make a sports experience valuable to them, fun for them, have nothing to do with winning, nothing to do with trophies, and everything to do with positive interactions with their coach, opportunities to play with their friends, opportunities to learn and improve new skills. Um, so the takeaway here is that youth sports as a whole has been suffering for some time from a very adult driven agenda oriented towards immediate results over joy and lifelong participation, leading to, uh, alluding to Benita's point just a moment ago. So Benita, I'll stick with you on this one because you have a unique perspective on this. As an Olympic gold medalist, you know, what was it like for you growing up as an elite athlete? And based on your experience now as an athlete, as a mom of athletes, um, how have things changed, especially when it comes to specialization and competition? I, I just think it's night and day. And I, I think back, you know, kind of going down uh, memory lane for a minute that uh, I'm getting my age, but I, I came to middle school not too long after Title IX was passed and uh, I live, I still live in Prince William County. I've lived all over the country, but I'm back here in Prince William County where I grew up, second largest county in the, in the state and up in Northern Virginia near DC. And, you know, thankfully because of uh, just more progressive, I think uh, educational focus, they had girl sports all through middle school and a plethora of them. And so I did gymnastics and I did majorettes and I did softball and I, I did all kinds of sports sampling as a youngster uh, and didn't really focus on track and field till I was 12 years old. That's almost blasphemy today, right? I mean, you, you're going to start a sport at 12 years old. Nobody starts a sport at 12 years old. My kids had to be professional uh, young athletes by the time they got to seventh grade and wanted to make the, the team. Both my, uh, especially my son, uh, you know, got to middle school at sixth grade and uh, they picked two freshmen for the football team. Uh, larger team, he was one of the two, he was taller than, than most and, uh, you know, good athlete. Uh, and only two freshmen on the varsity team in the middle school, he was one of the two. Again, a taller, more athletic, but, uh, but there were 140 kids that tried out for that 10 or 12 person team. And so, gosh, I, same thing happened with, with volleyball for my daughter when she got to middle school. The track team did, was used to be no cut when you got to middle school and high school. And now they cut it down from 150, 160 kids to 30 or 40 kids. And so it, it's, it's really, unfortunately, um, Sad. I think that we need more intramural opportunities for kids. I understand you can't have 25 kids on the varsity basketball team, but uh, and, and then JV and freshman. But kids just want to play, 
And so they have the rec or they have a club that they play for, but they, everybody's trying for this kind of um, elite youth uh, sports experience. And it, it's, it's tough. And for those, what uh, Nala was saying about uh, those families who have more uh, higher incomes are better able than to fund uh, Isaiah and Maya to play uh, those sports as a eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old. So when they get to 11 years old and they get to middle school, then they're ripe and ready to, to make the varsity team as, as a sixth grader or a varsity team as a freshman. The rest of these kids haven't had the benefit of that. And so we've got to find a way to, first of all, provide earlier sports experiences, uh, multi-sport experiences, and then also allow for a pathway for them to continue participating, even if they don't make the elite varsity clubs and teams. I think you just shined a real bright spotlight on an opportunity, a significant opportunity that exists for this particular segment of uh, professionals. You know, this is right in the wheelhouse of most adult recreation and um, sport and social club type uh, organizations. Their, their very mission in most cases is to deliver an inclusive, locally based, um, continuing opportunity to play and be engaged and find a sense of belonging. And that need exists for adults, but it also exists for kids, as Benita just pointed out. And I had to smile because if I don't smile about it, I'll cry about it. But you, you made the point that um, you were able to get involved at age 12, 13, which is almost unheard of. And I, I'm remembering back to um, the, the program I ran here in Appleton, I would get calls from parents of third graders saying my child has never played baseball before, has never played soccer before. Is it too late to get them? <laughs> At nine years old, a parent is thinking it's too late for my child to get involved in a sport if they haven't picked it up from the time and they were. The sad thing is, Nate, it probably, you know, in many cases it might be. Unless and you so, provide that opportunity, yeah, it might be. Yeah, if that yeah. opportunity is not there, it is too late. And yeah. so I think it's that not is- too late for them to play. But if they're in their minds thinking, is it too late for them to become, uh, to, to make you know, make the team when they get to middle school two years later, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. In, in our neighborhood, in our community, it, it probably would be. And I just don't even understand it. I didn't, because my parents provided so many opportunities, majorettes, softball, track, gymnastics, uh, when I was growing up, I, we just did the same thing for our kids. We, we didn't know if they were going to be good athletes or not, but just providing those opportunities. And it just so happens that they gravitated to certain things and we just continued to support them. But it wasn't with an eye of thinking, oh, I want them to ultimately become, you know, varsity athletes. That's right. That's right. Nyla, I want to build off that. So this next question is for you. Um, you know, there's some there's some positive trends in youth sports too. One is that there is an increased focus on the social emotional growth uh, among sports based youth development organizations. Um, so can you um, maybe put more context from your perspective on what is social emotional growth? How do you measure it? Um, and how do organizations make sure that they are creating a positive space for youth development? Sure. I mean, Benita did a, a pretty in-depth job with explaining what it is, but from our perspective, we look at social emotional growth in, in terms of how children are able to recognize their emotions, build relationships with one another, develop empathy, uh, connect with other children and adults and regulate their own emotions um, based on what they're feeling and the world around them. And as you guys already mentioned in sports, these are often exemplified in behaviors like teamwork, confidence, resilience, communication, um, and the ability to take a loss or to win graciously. Like that's really all a part of social emotional growth. Um, we feel very strongly that um, it's crucial to support this growth with positive interactions and creating a supportive environment for these skills to be fostered. Um, we focus in particular, I'm really glad that you guys brought this up because we focus in particular in developing these skills through our program curriculum. Uh, we combine that sport, we use sports as the show up, play, get active, see your friends, and then build in the character development exercises, reflection. Uh, we do a little bit of um, uh, those kinds of activities built into the curriculum. 
Um, in terms of measurement, there's a, still a lot of work and research being done to measure this quantitatively. As Benita mentioned, this is a lot of um, what people recognize anecdotally, um, but we measure it through surveying our kids and our families. So since we're particularly focused on building confidence and resilience in our kids, our character building activities um, are, are, are centered around that. And then we measure preseason, midseason, postseason through surveys of kids and actually of their with their families as well. Um, I also think it's really important to mention that when it comes to creating these spaces for youth development, um, the great news is there's a variety of resources out there. Like that's the positive trend. This isn't out of left field anymore. This is kind of front and center. And especially now with COVID, people understanding how isolation has really hurt um, this development in youth and adults as well, actually. Um, but there's a variety of resources out there um, that you can reference and model after. Um, we use the Aspen Institute's guidelines for re and resources and recommendations on how coaches can foster these environments. Um, but so the really important thing is coach training. So having the curriculum in place that actually does develop these um, behaviors, but also training the coaches in, in order to actually um, execute on them. So they need to be coached on more than training physical skills, but also how to practice listening, how to hold space for kids to talk, how to create opportunities to celebrate, um, and really just not shutting the kids down, um, but rather, um, you know, following their conversations, guiding kids as they bring up key issues um, is, is, is really the shift that we're seeing, especially in our space, because we are not uh, focused on generating elite athletes. We really are serving that, um, that population of kids who wouldn't otherwise have a chance to play and really trying to develop that love of learning. Um, so providing these coaches with the resources and training that they need to create these spaces is incredibly important. Um, and then also to gather feedback on the coaches um, from the kids and from the families to really create this feedback loop so that we know what we're doing is, is really working. And then, I mean, this kind of might seem silly, but also supporting the coaches and their social and emotional skills of the coaches so that they can create the environment that they need. Those are kind of the different areas that we look at um, in terms of creating those spaces for our kids. I'm glad you mentioned coaches because that's another nuance, another layer that we don't usually have to deal with at the adult level, but mm -hmm. retention of coaches is as critical um, of a need as retention of families. Um, they really are an extension of you. They define the experience that occurs on the field. And so in the past, I've found, you mentioned um, Aspen Institute Project Plays uh, recommendations and eight plays a few times. And I would totally agree. That's such an invaluable resource. The number one play, the number one recommendation is just what you said a moment ago. It's ask kids what they want. Um, that has to be an element of this. We have to have an appreciation for what kids are looking for in, experience, in an experience and not always go to that adult-centered um, definition of what success looks like. Uh, because to a kid, it's totally different. So while you were talking, I had one follow-up question that I wanted to ask, and that is, what happens in those moments where you encounter uh, a family or a parent who has that performance outcome in mind? And how do you how do you rein them back in to focus on the value that your program format is delivering? So we've actually done this from the very beginning in terms of setting expectations, uh, setting expectations with our coaches, setting expectations with our families as well. Um, we do sometimes get coaches from very competitive backgrounds and part of the training is reminding them why we are an organization. Um, that works with families as well. We do have kids who come, who play a variety of travel sports and they come to us as well as a more of a social with their friends to play um, and enjoy themselves. And what we find has been successful is really setting that expectation pretty upfront. Um, and the kids buy into it right away. And then the parents, as once they kind of see what the rest of the community has bought into, 
they tend to fall in line. That's what we've been, we've been noticing. There are, that's not to say that where our program is for every parent, there are parents who have elected not to participate with us, even though we are a quality program and they might be looking for something more competitive, but like Benita said, that's okay. We provide pathways. There are organizations that we can connect parents to, but we've been very clear about what the purpose of our organization is and what our mission is. And that really guides decisions like that. A foundation of culture. You're, you're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, a self-fulfilling and self-policing culture, which is important at any age. So um, mm -hmm. great insight. So I want to transition into the, the last section of, of this, um, this session and uh, make sure we leave enough time for some uh, questions from the audience at the end, too. So I want to talk a little bit about um, getting into the youth, getting into youth sports as an adult rec organization and the opportunity that exists uh, we've teased this a couple of times already, but um, inclusive community-based recreational play is something that, you know, almost all adult recreation and sport and social club type organizations have excelled at and built upon for many years. So for many of us in this space, this is our why. This is why we exist. This is our purpose. Um, but in the youth sports world, the term recreational is often twisted and misconstrued to mean unorganized, unimportant, somehow lesser than, uh, which is unfortunate. So when thinking about how our organizations as adult organizations can serve our communities in the realm of youth sports, there's a real opportunity to reclaim that narrative. Um, the fact is that high quality local recreational play is critical to expanding the base of participation in any given sport and to expanding the benefits of sports participation to kids in an equitable and inclusive way. So doing so helps lead directly to better developmental and athletic outcomes for kids and helps encourage a generation of future adults who value physical activity, who value play and want to continue to be engaged. So Tracy, this question is for you um, because you bring a very unique perspective here. Your organization started out as in adult programs and then expanded into the youth realm. So can you speak and give some insight on that traje trajectory? What was your why? And can you, can you kind of walk us through that pathway? Sure. Um, you know, we got married. We had kids. We wanted our kids to be active. We were looking for something that would fit with our busy life. Um, and what he was already busy doing as a three-year-old um, with his TOTS program and whatever else, just the socialization factor. Um, so we put him into a program, which was very similar to ours, play and practice all in the same day. Um, that's really the time that we could commit. Um, and that's exactly what our adult sports is like. You play and practice all in the same day. So this allows you to be able to have other activities um, or if you have other kids or if your parents are busy, it just gave an opportunity for more of a rec programming. Um, so right away, we loved it for our son. We had the opportunity to, um, to purchase that program that he was in and, and then grow it. Definitely saw a lot of kids. Um, at the time, there wasn't any, a lot of rec programming for sports um, back in 08. Um, since then, there's little critters, soccer shots, all kinds of things popping up, even I-9. And a lot of the club soccer groups have also started more recreational programming, which is awesome. It's, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, going back, um, it's just, it became very evident. And also the parents would tell us, that, hey, they've cut programming for sports at our schools. So they've asked us to now include middle schoolers and high schoolers. And so that kind of was the reasoning for us to increase our ages and to kind of plow forward and try something different. I also saw um, with all the concussion issues with football uh, that our flag football programming has definitely increased over the years. Um, We've just been kind of listening to our parents of what they need and what they want and trying to plan our programming accordingly, but not losing sight of our recreational just for fun, wanting the kids to learn to love to play right. um, mentality. Um, so we haven't added the tournaments or <laughs> any of that that they've asked us for, because that's not us. That's not what we want to be about. Right. I, I love that last comment. You have to know where your strengths are. 
you have to know what your brand is. And maybe mm-hmm. that's the point I'm trying to make. Follow up question, just because I think you're in such a unique um, position there, but what are the specific skills and experiences that adult rec leaders can bring to programs that operate within the youth sports space? What, what translates well? Well, I feel like um, you were cutting off in that question, but you were asking oh, what sorry. translates between adult and youth. Uh, the specific skills that um, adult rec leaders would have that translates well to the youth sports world as well. The biggest thing is passion, (laughs) passion for sports, passion for wanting others to enjoy it and be social. Uh, That was the biggest thing. Um, Yeah, just we're all parents. (laughs) Well, for the, um, those that are your customers. Um, So it's just figuring out what they need and what they want and then making that happen within the realm of what you, what your goal is. Um, But yeah, it's the passion really to keep people playing and learning to love to play. And it's really helped uh, build so many relationships, not just for the kids, but the parents. I've seen so many parents make good friendships from other families that are there with their kids participating. That's been great, that community building um, out there on the soccer and flag football field. Something we talked a lot about in our prep call uh, earlier this week was the need for community, especially emerging from a pandemic and um, how critical it's going to be to rebuild our communities, to have shared experiences, shared purpose, shared goals. And sports can be such a huge player in that. both adult and youth. I mean, it's, it's a reason to be in the same place at the same time, you know, physically, emotionally, everything. And it's, 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 I think it's really going to be a, a key to kind of rebuilding our sense of community as we move forward into later 2021. So I, great perspective. I really appreciate that. Um, Nyla, in your experience, uh, what would you say are the biggest differences between uh, youth and adult sports, at least in the delivery sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, what Tracy was mentioning, like there is a lot of commonality um, that we can you can really leverage. Um, you, everybody wants a high quality product. <laughs> everybody wants to get together. Um, some of the things that we learned very early on is that there are some additional factors to consider. Safety is obviously always a priority for youth and adults. You want to play in a safe space, uh, quality equipment, and all that. But I think that the risks are higher with youth programming. You have to consider the background checks for coaches. You have to make sure that your parents, parents aren't gonna drop their kids off if they don't feel safe and they don't trust that um, you know, the setup is safe uh, for them. Um, I think the other factor is program development. We touched on this a little bit. Um, it's tough to really just throw the ball out on the field and let the kids play, depending on what age group you're working with, with six to 12 year olds, you can't really do that. Um, so you really do need to build in this element of curriculum practice. Um, how, how, how are you actually going to run the experience um, as opposed to in the adult um, space where, you know, the adults show up, they know what they're there for and they kind of just get themselves moving. Um, I think the third one we also kind of touched on a little bit that piggybacks off of that is really the coaches training. Um, we, they, you need to understand why you exist as an organization. Um, why we exist, like I mentioned before, is to develop our kids, the, the uh, develop communities of uh, active, resilient, and confident kids. But that means that our coaches need to be trained. So because we, we focus on physical as well as social emotional skills, we need to make sure our coaches are equipped uh, to, and trained accordingly. Um, And then the last part, I think um, there are a lot of youth organizations out there. So you really have to hone in on what your uh, why is. Um, It's so important in terms of guiding what sports we offer, where we are, who, what schools we reach out to, what partners we work with. And, And Tracy kind of mentioned that, you know, you don't, we aren't in the competitive space and that's a very, that's a strategic decision, but that might be a good space for another organization. So those are kind of like the, the four or five uh, points that I think is our real differentiators. Excellent insight. Yeah, I appreciate that. And back to, you know, you finished with the br- a brand. It's, it's about making your brand, right? I mean, it's, it's critical as an adult organization, but it's critical when you're venturing into the youth sports space as well and knowing where your strengths lie, <laughs> knowing where your purpose is. 
Um, Benita, I think uh, you bring an interesting perspective here, but you know, with all your experience in youth sports, what, what do you see from your point of view as the opportunity that exists for adult rec organizers to make an impact in the youth sports segment? And how can they make it better? Where, where are they, where are they going to best spend their time here? I think, you know, the organizations that have been around for a while have, have already decided their why, you know, they've already kind of become ingrained. They, they have a culture that's already established, um, for their organization and for the participants and, and families that that uh, that uh, part participate with them, I, I just think if you're an adult rec organization filled with passionate uh, people who love that particular sport, who've obviously been playing it, you know, for so long as uh, as part of their lifestyle, and and get that there's this social aspect in addition to the competitive aspect, I think what you have the benefit of is looking at uh, project plays, eight plays, you know, looking at positive coaching alliance about how uh, both parents and, and, and coaches and families need to, to act and respond in the appropriate training. You have uh, the, the data that I talked about and that Nala talked about as far as the, uh, the youth development uh, aspect to sport and designing a program that can be high quality uh, that can provide uh, an excellent experience for those children and that puts a priority in the right places. I, for one, think you can have a competitive program that keeps score, that, that uh, has rankings and everything else and still have a high quality program and even quite frankly, have one that has a youth development aspect to it. We, we funded some organizations like that at Laureus that put kids into colleges on full athletic scholarships in that particular sport, but, but did so in a way that retained all the, the kind of good high quality aspects that, that Nala was talking about. So I think that doesn't have to be an either or. I think you, know, you can design and decide what level competitive program you wanna have, but I would just encourage if you're gonna do it, do it right. And you know, avail yourself of all the great resources out there that tell you and very prescriptively how to do it right. And, uh, you know, I, I like knowledge what she said about having a safe environment too, um, the, the safety aspect of it, both from a physical safety and an emotional uh, safety um, from a standpoint of safe sport and center for crazy sports. All of that is important, but yeah, high quality, uh, cr create it from the ground up and do it right. Great advice. And I think that that leads nicely into the conversation we're going to have next week. You know, the, the practical to do's, the uh, the best practices, the lessons learned. Um, I, I think there's going to be some real unique uh, experiences that come through on that, on exactly how to execute that. So, um, one more question on on this particular section, and then we're going to get to some audience questions. But um, Tracy, I think you're in the best position to shed light on this one, but. How has the expansion into youth sports had a positive impact on your organization's culture overall, as well as your brand, but I, I guess big picture on your community? Definitely brought the community together and it kind of from all different aspects from the kids side, the adult side, the corporate side, it's all kind of coming together. I know when we first started, we had two different brand names for the kids and our adults. I mean, it was still club sport kids, but we had stick figures in our logo. And at some point we just decided, you know, we could see how the trend was with our players having kids and putting them into the youth program. And we just wanted to keep that same brand name. So we kept the, the club sport logo for both kids and adults. So it's really, and even for our corporate events and stuff. So it's really just kind of come together and brought it full circle. Um, both in our um, in the youth side and in our adult side, but um, we have the participation all the way around, yeah. and it really has just pulled us all together. It's kind of like <laughs> a, a self feeding thing, which uh, uh, almost like a live organism, almost, which is really yes, a, it's a nice little cycle. 
Um, yeah, but we've true. also had um, some of our refs that have become refs for our youth leagues. And then we've had some youth uh, players that have decided, you know what, I want to make some money on this. And so now they're refing our youth leagues and then growing up to where now they're refing our adult leagues. I mean, it's just a constant cycle, but a lot of these kids they're now making money while going to college by refing soccer because they started it with our program at 14. I am so glad you said that because something that gets a lot of press in our country is the lack of coaches and the lack of officials. And I think if we trace that down to its root, we're going to see that a source of that problem is the number of kids that are eliminated from sports at eight, nine, 10, 11 years old and never play again. And that also means they never coach their own kids. They never officiate. They never value that sport as a, a, a rewarding part of their life. So I'm a big believer that most of the problems in sports can be solved by the way in which we address those problems at the youth level. So I think that story that you just told is a testament to how critical that is and that you, you're raising a generation of future adults who want to continue to be engaged in the sport. So great comment. I really appreciate that. Um, we did have a couple of audience questions come in. So I, I want to encourage anyone who might still have a question that they haven't asked, go ahead and put that in. Um, and then I'm going to start uh, divvying out these questions and going through them. Um, as I'm reading them, I'm reading them through for the first time. So I apologize if I uh, mumble over any words here. Um, but here's a question from our audience. Um, since coaching and mentoring is such an important part of this, uh, do you provide your volunteer coaches with specific training guides on how to run each practice for each age group? Um, if so, are there resources you would direct new leagues to to find these resources without having to create their own? So um, Nyla, do you wanna take that one? Sure. So um, we actually create um, our own training curriculum and we do provide our coaches with, uh, we always do an in-person training. Now it's been virtual because of COVID, but the idea is that we need to build this, this community of coaches and volunteers as well. So we train them in person and then we also provide them with resources and a curriculum. Um, we tend to run six to eight week seasons when we're in person. So we do provide a weekly curriculum of, of what should be covered both on the physical, but also as well um, on the, the character development as well. Um, we, like I said, um, there's a lot of great resources out there um, that you can turn to. Um, we've pulled from a variety. Uh, we love collaborating with other organizations as well. So um, I know uh, Benita mentioned Coaches Alliance. Um, there's Up to Us. There's uh, Project Play. There's just, there's so many out there um, that a quick Google search would actually provide a variety of, of resources. But what you really need to consider is just you need to know what your why is. And so that there is some sort of continuity in the curriculum that you're creating um, and, and using to train your coaches. Um, something just I, I think has worked really well for us as well is empowering our coaches. So we do give them the framework and the guidelines, but we do encourage that circle, that feedback loop uh, so that if they try to drill and it didn't work exactly how they liked or they have experience, prior experience coaching and they wanna to add to our, our curriculum, that communication channel is always open. Um, we are, we're really collaborative organizations. So um, it's, it's it, we're really building that community that allows um, our coaches to really use their skills as well. So I think it's a combined effort. You mentioned some great ones. Um, I, I can speak a little from my own personal background too, that there, there's a real movement in this country towards long-term athletic development. It's sometimes referred to as the American development model. And there are a lot of organizations out there. You mentioned collaboration. And I would say that's, a, that's, a, that's great advice because there are a lot of high profile organizations that have really embraced that. Uh, that model and invested resources into curriculum building. I know um, an organization we used to do a lot of work with was Junior NBA. So if you're working on a basketball curriculum, Junior NBA has a very um, age appropriate, developmentally appropriate, long-term athletic development plan in place with weekly lesson plans for every single age group and they make it totally free. Um, so we use that for a lot of our basketball programming, uh, for soccer. If you're getting into soccer, 
Um, most of Major League Soccer has embraced the American development model for, for soccer uh, development. And most, most local clubs in MLS will provide you with that age appropriate, developmentally appropriate curriculum uh, to guide you through. Um, you mentioned Project Play too, and I, there's, they have a how to coach kids curriculum that's not sports specific, but it gets into a lot of the social, emotional, physical, uh, educational um, strategies on how to engage with kids. And that's a, that's a great app-based, video-based uh, curriculum on creating a baseline with your coaches, which I, I've used. I don't know if any of you have used, but it's, it's a great resource and it's, again, totally free. So um, great perspective there too. So uh, Tracy, I think this one would be good for you. Um, in regards to partnerships, uh, you know, which I, I mean, if there, if there have been any that have been beneficial to your adult leagues, what, what partnerships have played into successful youth sports programs in your community? Um, do you have any experiences or stories where you worked with parks and recreation uh, private companies, et cetera, to really lift up the, the youth programming? Two things. Uh, one, we partner with Big Brothers Big Sisters. Mm -hmm. We offer a discount for bigs if they want to bring their little out and play each week. That's been huge. Um, I think we've also, from that, been able to um, find bigs for them. Um, we also partnered with the local it's not MLS, but it's like a step down ALS <laughs> uh, franchise where they allow us to come out and play halftime in the middle of their game. Um, they also have some um, opportunities for the players, the professional soccer players to play with the kids and do clinics, which has been fun. Um, so that's been a great partnership as well. Um, and then just Actually, we partnered with a school district trying to give discounts for school teachers for their kids to be a part of our programming as well. That's awesome. actually helped quite a bit um, and also just spreading the word and knowing that we also offer financial assistance program for those kids that, that they have in their classroom that definitely have some energy and need to get it out, but their parents might not have the income for it, then they kind of turn them towards our program so that we can get them out there and it helps their socialization as well. So it's good. Awesome. It's I love way. all those. Those are innovative ideas too. And they just, they just help build up the momentum for the program. So I, I thanks for sharing um, those experiences with us and those thoughts with us. Um, I definitely want to thank all of you. I thought the insight was fantastic. Um, I, I really appreciate each of your level of expertise on this topic. I hope it was beneficial for everyone that was listening in. Um, again, this was meant to just kind of provide a broad uh, overview of, of what the youth sports segment is all about um, and provide some insight into opportunities that might exist for, for those of you that uh, operate within the adult sports space, uh, navigating into this for the first time. So uh, remember session two, we're gonna, we're gonna dig into more, some very specific and practical things that you can do uh, to get the ball moving on this, no pun intended, um, and some best practices, lessons learned from people who have been there, done it, um, and so we hope that you'll make the time to uh, join us again next Wednesday for part two. But I just want to thank my guests one more time, Nyla, Tracy, Benita. Um, I really appreciate your time, your insight, your expertise. Um, it's a real pleasure having you on and, and having this conversation. So thanks again. Thank and uh, thank for those of you uh, in our audience, thanks for the questions. And we hope to see you uh, next Wednesday back here. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It's everybody. <laughs>